Seven decades ago, a relatively simple math question was asked for the first time. What's the lowest number of colors with which we can color the entire plane so that no two points at unit distance have the same color? This number we're looking for is the chromatic number of the plane. That's the hartwig nelson problem. The answer to this question is so far not known and neither do I know it. The question I do aim to answer in this video is how we have to color the plane. So far all working colorings that give us an upper bound have been tessellations with tiles. And on an intuitive level only tile based colorings seem to work properly, but non tile based colorings haven't been ruled out yet. So do we need to use tiles or do we need to use some coloring method without tiles? I'll present a theorem why coloring without tiles is inherently inefficient, but be advised this work hasn't been peer reviewed. Let's first review the basics of the problem we are looking at. We don't know the answer to the question, but we have some bonds for the answer. We get the upper bound from the best known working tessellations, such as this one. Let's briefly talk about tile diameter. You might have heard about using tiles with diameter slightly less than one, but we can actually use a diameter of exactly one. Let's say our central hexagon spans from 0 to 1. If both points were blue, then indeed we would have a problem. However, we can have 0 be blue and 1 be either green or yellow. In two dimensions, there are tilings that only work like this, but that has no bearing on our best known upper bond. In three dimensions, however, it does have ramifications for the upper bond. Using an adequate tiling like this, we can periodically tile the entire plane with seven colors. And as required, no two points at unit distance share the same color. These hexagons are further apart than unit distance and with the boundaries as explained, are just small enough to avoid tile internal conflict. This gives us the upper bound for the answer. Whatever the exact answer is, it has to be seven or less. On the other end, we get our lower bond from finite subsets of the plane for which we know the chromatic number. 2 and 3 are trivial to understand. With 4 colors it already gets a bit more complicated. Here we see the molar spindle which requires 4 colors and has 7 vertices. Let's take a closer look at it for a moment. Whereas with 2 and 3 vertices and colors we had no flexibility with our coloring, here we have a little. 4 of our vertices have all the used colors within them or their neighbors, but the triangle marked here could have some additional yellow without raising the total number of colors we are using. For now just keep this flexibility at the back of your mind, we'll come back to it. Those were the bonds we knew, at least 4, maximally 7. A bit over a year ago, Aubrey de Grey published a graph that raised the lower bond to 5, a breakthrough that started a polymath project. While his initial graph is too big and complicated to be useful here, Marin Huell has subsequently made smaller and smaller 5 chromatic graphs. Let's take a moment to appreciate one of the smallest such graphs at this point in time, with 553 vertices. We will return to this graph towards the end of this video. Let's start to build up towards the tile theorem. First we need a specific function for computing connected vertices, generalized for any dimensionality we want to look at. This function takes in a set of points and outputs a set of points. For now let's take a look at the two dimensional case. If our input is a single point then the output is a circle around this point. This is how it looks like on the plane. If our input is a one dimensional line we can see that the output also changes and covers a roughly annulus shaped two dimensional area. If our input is a circle itself then the output will be an annulus and one of the things we'll quickly find here is that only the outer boundary of the input actually matters. If we look at this dynamic from the perspective of dimensionality we find that in general if the input is zero dimensional the output will be n minus one dimensional. If the input has one or more dimensions the output will always be n dimensional. Another important trait of this function is that it can be iterated. Let's see that in action on a simple number line first. If we take 0 as our initial input, the output of that will be 1 and negative 1. If we take those as our next input, our output will be 2, negative 2 and 0. Just as we alternate throughout and even in the iterations, we alternate back and forth between two sets of points we can color accordingly, a bipartite graph. We can iterate in a slightly different way as well. Instead of replacing our input with the resulting output, we add the output to the input. 
Iterating like this, we get the set of all points we can reach in a given number of steps. On the number line, we quickly see that most points are actually permanently out of reach. Starting with zero, the only points that are connected are the integers, leaving this interval disconnected. As it is on a whole different component of the graph, it has no bearing on the coloring. And here we can also see that a non-tile-based coloring is definitely possible in one dimension. We can color all the points in this interval A independently and in any way we want. So long as subsequent intervals alternate based on our initial interval A, we still have a chromatic coloring without using tiles. Now we're ready to take a look at the reason this doesn't work in two or more dimensions. Let's take a look at the simplest finite graph with two colors, using just two vertices. We can take this subgraph of the plane and expand the vertices into n balls, covering some area. We already know that this n ball subgraph has a chromatic number of exactly 2. Using what we established, let's start with an initial point and then iterate. Though we started with a zero-dimensional point, already with the initial exclusion zone, we see that we have a one-dimensional line in the other ball. Another step and we find that a two-dimensional area is explicitly locked to one color. And it becomes very clear what this iteration inevitably marches towards. And that's the only way to color this bipartite subgraph with two colors. There is explicitly no other way to use only two colors here. And this equivalence doesn't stop with other graphs. Likewise, we can embed the Moser spindle in the plane and expand the vertices to cover some area. N balls being in the exclusion zone of one another is equivalent to vertices sharing an edge. Just as with the finite Moser spindle, at least four N balls need to be single colored. The other three can support a bit additional color, but there is no point in using more than one color per N ball. The proven de Brown Erdos theorem states that for infinite graphs with a finite chromatic number, there exists a finite subgraph with that chromatic number, and this is the last piece we need. Every finite unit distance graph can be embedded and expanded in the space, yielding at least some areas that require a single continuous color. Larger single colored areas give more efficient colorings. For unit distance graphs in Euclidean spaces, there exists a tessellation with single colored maximum diameter Jordan Brower separated spaces with the same chromatic number as the whole space. In two or more dimensions, the use of such single colored spaces is unavoidable. Let's take another look at our five chromatic example. With the presented theorem, we would expect that stricter limitations on colors force the use of larger tiles and we should see this behavior reflected in finite graphs too. And as you might be able to tell from a glance, that's indeed what we see here. The fifth color is restricted to this center vertex only. So let's take a look at the other four colors respectively. And like this, we indeed see exactly this expected patchiness. From what I've gathered, the mechanics behind this patchiness are also demonstrable with just four colors and the Golomb graph. I will likely try to dive deeper into this matter, but that's going to take a while. Thanks for watching. That's it for now, but there is more waiting where this came from. A lot of people have contributed to the Polymath project, and there are many more results and techniques that deserve a spot in future videos. If you're interested to check it out yourself, I'll leave a link in the description.